Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. If you're watching the show on YouTube on Drinking Bros Podcast, you'll know this is a dramatic moment where we're going to go to a, a wide here for Hamidi Jassim, who's back again, a.k.a. the terrorist Whisper, you've seen the film on Amazon Prime at this point. If you haven't rented, if you haven't read his book, you got to get it. He is our man on the ground in the Middle East. And I'm going to be honest, at this point, if you're not trusting Hamidi, you're trusting no one. Uh, last time you were on, on the show, you were telling us about uh, uh, our, meaning. our yep. favorite guy, um, our Muktada. dude. The, Muktada Sadr, yeah. yeah. Who's... Uh, Trying to change the world over there. Um, Pretty much. Yeah, as of yesterday, this was about three weeks later, uh, close to four weeks, the AP, a.k.a. Reuters, was uh, giving you guys the exclusive story on what was happening over in Iraq, which you had already obviously given us. Yeah. Um, did I hear this right that we got named to... Like as a terrorist group or the drinking bros? Did? <laughs> I think I I think no joke. We are officially spying on Iran. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there we go. I think the Ayatollah is gonna go like drinking bros. Even these guys, <laughs> <laughs> even these guys are after me. Who? Wh where did you get that info? Who told you that? No, it's actually um, it's um, because uh, you saw that the four. Four weeks ago when I was here the last yeah, yeah, time, yeah. we talked about the secret meeting that Muqtada Sadr had in Iran mm -hmm. about the next plan for the Middle East or Iraq yeah. specifically. And um, you saw I sent you the link. It came out on the news just two days ago. Yeah. About 48 hours ago, actually. Exactly. So we were like actually you're about beating, yeah, three you're, weeks. You're, yeah, you're beating these people by about yeah. three to four weeks in, yeah, and, in and information. It, and, you know, this is information that I don't find online or, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a – Intel guy. You know, my whole <clears throat> career working for the US Intelligence was actually collecting street level intelligence. Mm -hmm. Street level intelligence, basically intelligence that you don't find anywhere in the server. These are word to mouth on the street. It means you have to have sources on the ground that can get you this information. Right. So the the good thing that through my career as an <clears throat> intelligent asset that I kept in touch with all the sources that I had in Iraq. Perhaps I left Iraq, I came here and all the sources are still in the same position in the same place to this day, sixteen years later. So that's the beauty of it. So when I'm getting that, we call it, it's off the giant mouth. We're getting this information directly from the source. No media sources would probably make it within two to three weeks to get this kind of information. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really showing numbers. And this is something that the mainstream media does not have the capabilities to get hold of unless they pay lots of money and recruit an actual source within the enemy, which they don't have. Yeah, and the, and the crazy thing is, is I want to tell the audience this because yeah. every time you come, uh, we have a, a brand new like 4,000 square foot studio here in, in Wilmington. You're usually hovered in the kitchen with pages and pages of notes pouring yeah. over them from your sources. H hold those up to camera real yep, quick there here. It is, right there. If, you're, if you are watching the video <laughs> show and you're subscribed to, to Drinking Bros Podcast yeah. on YouTube, it is pages and pages of notes all in Arabic. It's in some kind yeah. of squiggly language. I don't yeah. understand, man. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking before the show about yeah. how funny it would be if uh, yeah. Hamity just started developing a redneck accent. Yeah, I down in North it, Carolina. Down yeah. in North, I'm down in North Carolina, man. Yeah. Hell yeah. D yeah, do your redneck accent. <laughs> it's hilarious. Arabic. I don't know how to read Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read that mess. Hell no, man. They Hell write, no. They, man. Write, they go. They go in the wrong direction. I'd film. rather go get some barbecue than rent after some dairy terrors. <laughs> <laughs> For, for Halloween, we're going to have to have you dress up in some cut-off jean shorts, <laughs> yeah. a, a Bud Light tank top. And a fucking, You're going to have uh, to paint me. For and, a like a, and a MAGA hat. Like yeah. a, blonde, a blonde mullet wig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah, brother. I don't, I don't fuck around with none of that. All right? <laughs> Trick-or-treaters are coming up, and you're offering kids pork. <laughs> you know, just ribs. Y'all want a rib? Bacon. That's These moose lambs don't want one, so. Uh, <laughs> this is our Muslim test. You yeah. ain't no Muslim, yeah. is you? Yeah. Have a rib. Eat this rib, or I'll punch hey, you in your fucking face. Don't feel bad, man. I ate lots of pork in Iraq when I was in, you know, in Iraq in two thousand five, two thousand seven. Out of choice, or was that no? The only actually, thing I, uh, I, you know, when you go to the DFAC back, pork then, rib, bro. You know, mm. you have all kind of buffets in the, in yeah. the U.S. military DFAC, and DFAC is short for dining. Don't, you facility. don't know, okay. but so I was eating ribs for like three months, and finally, one of the Indian guys, you know, behind the yeah. the buffet that works <clears> in the kitchen. And he goes, I thought you were a Muslim, man. And I was like, I am. 
And he goes, so why have you been digging into, like, the ribs for the last three months? And I was like, well, are they pork? And he's like, yes, they are. I said, well, well they tasted great. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude. Can you imagine, like, all those, I mean, clearly all those rules came from a time when yeah. there were uh, swine. Or, so pigs have really similar bodies to ours, genetically speaking, mm -hmm. which is why we test chemicals on them and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. And you can grow, like, a human ear on them. So diseases that are common to human beings often get spread through pigs because yeah. one they're close to us and two they're nasty that's creatures true. sure right so that's why at some point point, eighty thousand years ago someone's like oh god said don't eat pigs like uh, honestly you, if you. you if you believe in god and you think that yeah. god is a is a like an ethical and moral being of some sort do you really think he drew a line at the deli aisle like that's where that's the line in the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah like you can't yeah. be a jew or a muslim if you're fucking eating pork that's that's the one huh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you're a catholic and you eat beef on fridays that's it you're just done yeah it's just just like in our culture you know we have people who be like hey can you eat pork no yeah yeah why what do you, what do you drink alcohol and we're like what's the difference if god said no to alcohol no yeah. to pork but you're still not eating pork, but you're drinking a bunch of alcohol. So yeah, yeah. What's it do? You're fucking it up anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and it's still to our culture. You know, people would not eat pork, but they will drink gin and all kind of messed up stuff. Yeah. That's well, how it is, I man. drank quite a bit of something yeah. last night. I don't remember what it was. We, we went hard. <laughs> last night was uh, my birthday. And oh, yeah. uh, we, we went out last night Thanks. and went real hard. Various types of pork and uh, <laughs> crazy uh, amounts I, of liquor. I had a pork belly, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and, and last night was Fat Tuesday. So okay. that's, a, that's a big thing here big for Mardi thing, Gras. Yeah. And yeah. we were unaware. And it was just like every bar we walked into. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. beads and people were raging doing shots and all that shit. <laughs> and we were like, oh, fuck it. All right. Now you're going to see those people walking around like zombies with charcoal crosses on their fucking heads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody who got hammered last night is going to have a, an <laughs> Ash Wednesday cross on, Ash their, Wednesday. on their head today. So we are recording this on, uh, on February 26th. This will be airing... Uh, uh, obviously, Sunday night at eight o'clock. Yeah. Um, clearly, when you're here at this point, shit is not good over there. So it's always shit is not. Well, good. this is <laughs> <They're done laughs> no place, some of this is good news. So um, everybody knows about Soleimani and uh, his his little fucking friend that got murked on the uh, Al Mohandas. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on. Uh, uh, wait, how do you say it? Al Abu Mahdi Al Mohandas. Mohandas. That's okay. Yeah, Al Mohandas. So uh, yeah, everybody knows about that guy. So. Uh, I'll let you fill in what. Yeah, what we're, happened we're this actually past week. sharing pictures of uh, the 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 meeting that we're sharing the pictures of today. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He's on it. Oh, really? That, that's yeah. He was on it. It was actually just days before he got airstriked. No kidding. Yeah, that Shh. meeting with the with, he got you know so. thunderstruck. Some might say. Yeah, yeah, he did. I think uh, they only found his dick though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I you you were the one who actually showed us the real pictures. Yes, and it was yeah. uh, there was yeah. a hand. Yeah. And then maybe twenty eight feet worth of intestines and some yeah, other yeah. things like they found like I think Soleimani's penis on top of the engine or something. Well, was that I'm, what it was? I'm serious, yeah. Holy shit. And the Rockies were making like shit memes of that thing. They were like making jokes like no one business. <laughs> I was actually just looking for the jokes. I was looking for information. That's it. Yeah, I was looking for the jokes. They were like making jokes and Soleimani dick memes. Yeah. Is, they, uh... they actually had made one that was really funny. They said like they brought the wife, Soleimani's wife, uh -huh. to they identify, they identify the, dick. the yeah. body and they showed her the dick and she was like, Oh, definitely that's not my husband, that's the driver. <laughs> 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 Oh man, that's fucking hilarious! Uh, what do you what do you got for us today here, Hamidi? Um, today, actually, it's a it's a crazy day. This information was just really fresh uh, off Iraq. This is, you know the last time we talked about details into how Iran actually um, do money laundry through Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, today, uh, we got information which is really off the ground. It's not anywhere else. This is something off the giant mouth, as we say. Um, Wait, off what? Off the giant mouth. The and giant it's like, Yeah, it's like mouth. you're taking it off the giant mouth. Mm. And this is something that um, I've been actually digging into for a long time, trying to figure out who the personalities are. Mm -hmm. So Iran had had a really tough time in the last um, a few months. Right. Uh, you mm. saw a lot of rage, a lot of uh, protests in Iraq, a lot of mm. anti-Iranian agenda. Mm -hmm. So one of the most difficult jobs for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was to control the media and, and to enhance the picture of the Iranian regime in the Middle East through the countries like Iraq, Syria, uh, Yemen, uh, other countries, Bahrain, and all the Middle East where they had their control. Uh, and the Revolutionary Guard 
uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard have never had any difficulties with anything before. Mm -hmm. They wanted to kill somebody, they want to assassinate, it gets done immediately. <laughs> one of the hardest jobs they faced, one of the hardest things was actually how they can enhance the picture of the Iranian regime naturally in this generation. Because if they don't, they have a whole entire generation coming against them, protesting, hating on Iran. So what they did is they actually, in the recent uh, couple days, they have put a bigger budget towards recruiting and actual media reporters in Iraq. So you, the, mean, you, you mean they're trying to turn uh, Iraqi media people into assets, basically? Uh, they already have that, mm. but they actually now they're, ex they're expanding that project mm. uh, twice. They're putting more money. There's, perhaps they're putting $5 million more. Wow. Into it. So, what, so can you uh, describe what the Iraqi media is like? So the, right Iraqi, the Iraqi media after 2003, after Saddam had went down, before Saddam, we had about two channels that was controlled by yeah. the Iraqi government. After that, it became a, you know, a, a public industry. <coughs> Anybody can own it. It became a business. Mm -hmm. So we had channels that opened from all over the place. Uh, anybody that had the bit, it became more of like independent industry kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can go open a channel and do your thing. Um, the crazy part <clears throat> is we have 17 channels in Iraq, 17 of them, were paid by Iran. When you say paid by, how? Completely paid, funded by Iran. Kind of like how Al Jazeera is owned how by Al Jazeera the is funded UAE by Qatar. Government. Exactly. Oh, Qatar government, yeah. So 17 Iraqi channels were funded by Iran. What they really do psychologically is when you have 17 channels putting the same exact information, and you're seeing it in every single channel, you're going to believe it. But they figured recently this was not doing enough. So they decided. Are these all news channels or is it like there's. News. Completely everything. It's, it's all news. So they're not like. Yeah. I, I wonder if they're uh, making like television, like sitcoms it, or dramas oh, that have embedded oh, absolutely. propaganda. In oh, absolutely. Like you would think so, so, right? So it's a full I, channel. I, I feel like. I know this sounds strange, man. Yeah. I feel like this is partly going on over here at a very, very smaller Similar, scale. Yeah. But. For, for the government and what's going on. You so, think it's the government and the U.S. doing it, though? I think it's more like just the woke crowd. Th that's, 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 what I, that's what I think as well. So I don't, I don't think it's, it's the government, but <clears throat> since the, our media isn't controlled by the government, yeah. it's somebody at the top. So you, you look exactly. at today, like uh, yeah. maybe around 30 minutes ago, uh, there's an ABC correspondent, David Wright, yeah. um, who's, you know always reports for ABC and in particular politics. He covers politics yeah. for this. Um, he was caught by, th there's a thing called Project Veritas that's run by a, a guy named James O'Keefe. Yeah. And he goes undercover, talks to these people, and then he gets their real opinions off air. Yeah. So he had this guy today on, and he said, look, man, what's the, what's the real story with ABC News? And the guy's like, man, truthfully, I'm a socialist. And, and this is what David Wright said. And yeah. he goes, truthfully, I'm a socialist, but we have to report on stories that are told to us we, we can no longer turn in what we want and, and, and report the truth. Yeah. It is more leaning towards a narrative. And he goes, if I'm being honest, there is a lot of good things that Trump is doing well that they tell us we cannot report on them. Um, and he just got suspended right you know, away. Oh, yeah. a half hour ago for saying this. He is a journalist for ABC. He was just in a ball, like he was just clearly speaking Crazy. his mind, not yeah. anywhere near the news outlet. Like he was having a genuine yeah. conversation. He did not know he was re being recorded, obviously. But uh, yeah. the same thing happened to Van Jones over at CNN yeah. um, on the Russian hoax thing and whatever. And it's like, man, we're this close to that. It, yeah. feel, it feels like over here. But yeah. when the government buys that out. Um, the effect that that has on the Iraqi youth or Iranian yeah. youth, yeah. that will go on for generations. Yeah, for the whole Middle East, actually, not yeah. just Iraq or yeah. Iran. I mean, we have the same exact case overseas, man, like years and years back. And the only difference between us and you guys is that they can kill the reporter. Here they fire him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the only difference between us and you guys. Which is a big difference yeah. because, look, yeah. that will completely stop you from reporting a news story. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Khashoggi, mm -hmm. you know, they chopped that guy up yeah. uh, pretty brutally um, for, for reporting against, who was it, the Saudi prince at yeah. the time? Yeah. yeah. Here's, Absolutely. What, here's what Wright said. He says, uh, I feel ter terrible about it. And by it, he means uh, the bosses at ABC telling him what he can and can't report, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, so he says, I feel terrible about it. I feel that the truth suffers, that voters are poorly informed. 
and people have the opportunity to tune in to whatever they want to hear. So it's like there's no upside. Our bosses don't see an upside in doing the job we're supposed to do, which is to speak truth to power and hold people accountable. Yes. I, I mean, that's sad. What can the I, I wonder, aside from just uh, a suspension? No, I'm, I wonder, aside from people just not listening to ABC and CNN and Fox anymore, what can be done about that at this point? I don't know. So I looked at the ratings. Um, <clears throat> the, the ABC News and, and David Muir, and that's how they measure it. Yeah. There's a 6.30 time slot that goes across ABC, CBS, uh, the big three networks, yeah. essentially. Fox isn't, d- doesn't really do it. Um, and that's how they measure like, who has the biggest news, right? Because it goes out for free and everybody else. David Muir at ABC and ABC News in particular is number one. And, and they're number one by a lot. So if that's the number one news network, and here's a guy that is your political correspondent saying that, where are we as a society with that, you know, as far yeah. as news goes and, and, the, and the distrust for news? Yeah. Um, you know, I, Trump was the first one that I, I can recall yeah. who was yelling out fake news, fake news, fake news. Yeah. Before that, I didn't really see it like that, but uh, you know, you go back in time and you start looking through it. Yeah, it, it was probably like that all along, but well, I just I mean, didn't John, pay as much attention. John Stewart did that bit uh, back in the day about Crossfire. Remember that? Oh yes, yeah. Like he completely tore them apart. Yeah, yeah. Because he's like, "Why are you taking what's the worst thing about politics and making it an entire show? Mm-hmm. The worst thing being two people entrenched in their positions." not really debating, just yelling their points at each other, and then that's it. Like, there's no, nobody ever comes to any kind of conclusion there. Look, life is not always black and white. There are a lot of gray areas, and we all have different experiences in life and different situations that require uh, flexibility in, in our legal system, right? Exactly. Uh, and then and, and social policy and all this other bullshit. But yeah. there is a, mathematically speaking, there is a best economic system for us. Right. That exists somewhere. And it's it's got to be when I say best, I don't mean like the most profitable. I mean, the economic system that provides for our country the best provides whatever needs money, health care, et cetera. Right. Uh, there, I don't see any reason why we can't come to consensus on shit like that. Yeah, I like new. There's some things that's going to change. There's some things that should not you should not introduce profit motive into education is one mm-hmm. like these universities charging forty thousand dollars a year for kids to go to school yeah. is fucking crazy to me and when you look at the the numbers behind that like teacher pay professor pay has gone up like i think 30 percent over the last 25 years and administrative fees like uh the the uh, uh, higher up salaries shit like that mm-hmm. have gone up about two thousand percent at u.s universities yeah so it's not like it's not like the the actual process of educating our kids has gotten harder or more costly. It's the same as every other thing that's going on in the United States right now. Like I hate to lend credit to some of these dipshit uh, socialists out there, but they kind of have a point about corporations and education. Like this is fucked up. Yeah. When you introduce some the profit motive is a good thing for capitalism, but. There are some things that should not be in there. Healthcare is one of them. Like, yeah, I want doctors to get paid really well, mm-hmm. right? But I don't want drug companies to be fleecing the American public like this. Yeah, and true. we we've it, how many times has it been proven that they are with, withholding cures so, because the the treatment is more profitable than the cure? Like that is you should go to jail for that. That's the for, cure I was taking for my brain tumor. Yeah, it was in Canada for twenty five years, and it just got approved in the U.S. like a year ago. But it was in Canada for 25 really? years. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah. fucking crazy, dude. So, uh, yeah, I'm not I, – I don't know if Medicare for all, the numbers don't add up. But one of the reasons the numbers don't add up is because there's no, nothing saying some company can't charge you $25 for a fucking aspirin on your yeah. insurance plan. You know what I mean? So it's like, what's the government's role there? I, I, I think the government should have a very limited role when it comes to, to business and shit like that. Like, keep the peace. Make sure nobody's getting taken advantage of, sure. Yeah. But for the most part, keep out of it. Uh, I think this is one of those cases where the government needs to do something. The government needs to pass. Like I don't. I, if Trump should just, he, and he's been fighting it in court. So he uh, recently had a, a case that was uh, really anti-drug company that was going through the court systems and stuff like that. But I feel like an executive order, maybe, where he just says, 
you know, uh, if you if you price gouge with with drugs, we're gonna fucking butt fuck you back to the Stone Age. Like we're gonna shut your goddamn company down. That's I like. Hell yeah. I like. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm looking up. Uh, Gil, I'm, I'm looking up one right now that I remember in particular. Yeah. So I, I have a bunch of stocks, right? I've had a, mm-hmm. a decent portfolio for years, and I and I follow it. Um, I I used to heavily invest into some of these drug, yeah. uh, these big pharma. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them was Gilead. So I had Gil, this company Gilead for years, right? And they were just torching it. Now <coughs> Gilead, for example, was. Uh, <coughs> Doing trials for Hep C, mm-hmm. they were doing trials uh, Hep C overseas. Are they the one where the, the CEO went to jail? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I, I know. I, I know this about it, right? Uh, as the trials were going along, right, you have to pass like three phases, yeah. and it's over the course of like six years or something like that. Which <coughs> that still mystifies me, where it's just like you have to wait all this period of time for these drugs. Um, so the stock would keep inching up as these test trials would go better and better and better. And then finally, they had a cure for Hep C, and I was like, "Oh man, this this is gonna go through the roof, right?" Yeah. I, it it had already seen close to a hundred percent increase, yeah. and I was fine <laughs> with it. Um, and the, the, you know, once they got on TV and they're like, "Oh, we have the cure for Hep C, and this is gonna be great," um, they were like, "But if you have the stock, you should definitely sell this now." You know, coming up, and I was like, "Oh, why?" Once it's out there into the world. Then somebody can just rip it and make a generic version of it and then sell it at a cheaper price. Because they were selling these for like yeah. know, 15000 a pop to cure hep C overseas. Yep. Yep. Um, and then once it got ripped, and you know, and now it's 5 bucks or whatever, and you, yeah. can, and you can cure hep C. And yeah. uh, you have to get rid of the stock. So, I mean, that's, that's kind yeah. of what it is. And looking at the numbers now, I was just looking at the stock on my phone. Uh, it's down to 74. It, it, at its highest point, <laughs> yeah. it was in the uh, 120, 130 range. And it's like, dude. You know, it, you're right. It does not benefit yeah. the drug companies or anyone else yeah. to find a cure immediately because one, the companies go down, yeah. and then two, you can't kill off certain segments <clears throat> of the culture yeah. that you would like, in particular with AIDS. Obviously, yeah, like I'll tell you what, uh, Connecticut. If you see in the state of Connecticut, they ha- they've been ha- they've been fighting badly. Uh, they just passed a bill. I think vaccinations in Connecticut are now mandatory. Oh, really? Everybody now in Connecticut <clears throat> have to vaccinate. Yeah. Because before they used to use, like, uh, a religious waiver. Yeah, exemptions. Uh, and yeah. now they just passed a bill. <clears throat> and actually, it's the Democrats who wants that. And, I, it and, should yeah. be everybody. Because I, yeah. I, I have kids, and yeah. it's just like, dude. I In, in yeah. California, when I was living in L.A., you know, for 18 years, that yeah. was the big thing of, like, oh, don't vaccinate your kids. Yeah. You can get autism or things like that. Jenny McCarthy was yeah. leading yeah. that charge. There was one uh, professor in London that theorized that and then like within the first two years of his paper being published it got torn to pieces by the actual Shredded. medical community yeah and uh but jenny mccarthy just saw it on the internet mm-hmm. years after it had already been destroyed and turned wow. this into a whole fucking movement so you had a bunch of these kids who were not getting vaccinated in california and they were coming down with like diseases from like the 1920s like you know uh, like measles and shit. measles and mumps polio and, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah and you're yeah. just like, like ridiculous hey man what the fuck um, and then yeah. sending these kids to school with other kids yeah. That probably should be mandatory at this point. Speaking yeah, so. of polio, uh, Jonas Salk. Yeah. Right? Big fan. The guy that cured it. Cured it, yeah. Um, you know how much? He got, he got paid, like, I think $7,000. For and it, curing polio? It was his lab fees. That's all. He he billed the government for his lab fees, and that's it. And gave them. <laughs> the U.S. government owns the patent to the polio vaccine. And is it $7,000? 7, 7, 7, that's it, seven grand. Like, he, his family should have wow. made, if he, if he had gone through a normal process, his Billions. Family, $5 billion. Yeah. That's how much his family would have made. My that guy God. needed a lawyer. Yeah. No, yeah, he man. didn't. He did or it he needed on, FDR to no, he, <laughs> fucking live. He knew it. He knew. Like, he did that on purpose. He's like, I'm not going to charge people for a cure for something that's killing people. Like, ah, I'm not going to do that. That's cool. Yeah, it's funny. Elon Musk did that with uh, his patents for with the batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he said, wants Look, everybody can take them. I don't give a shit. He wants more people to make the car. So yeah. the government will fund his project. It's about twenty two billion dollars over 10 years. And basically what it does is um, it makes it, it. There's a honeycomb s- style pattern across the entire United States where there's charging stations every 150 miles, basically. Mm. So there's you're never out of reach of a charging station. It'd be great. I mean, look, you, you could also just <clears throat> do it at gas stations. That would be pretty cheap. You could, but they're all privately owned, and that would be million contracts. Like even uh, even if you go to like a Shell gas station, it's most of those are privately owned franchises now. Yeah. So they just pay a fee, a licensing fee. You would have to go through each, like, it fuck that. Yeah. I remember uh, Josh had a Tesla, and we, we drove to Raleigh, yeah. and uh, we'd, we'd just stop at a mall. 
Yeah. And just plug it in yeah. for like, and then go have lunch for like an hour and a half. Yeah. And then, you know, that was it. I was going to be our way home. I mean, it's weird. Yeah, it's really weird. Um, um, before, hey, before we get to your info, though, yeah. I want to, since you're here, I, I want to ask you um, some questions about our U.S. politics that are going on. Yeah, In particular with, with the media, uh, like we were talking about earlier. So the, the report came out this week about Bernie Sanders that Russia was trying to help him win the Democratic nomination uh, to go up against Trump uh, for president because they think Trump can easily beat Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders um, has known for a month and finally decided to come public with this information. And then today they dropped uh, an interview with his wife that she did on Russian TV um, <laughs> about four years ago, uh, talking about why she would have her husband would have been the better candidate and all this other stuff. Over in the Middle East, are they rooting for Trump? Are they rooting for someone else to get in office? Like, would they be rooting for Bernie Sanders? Do you know that as far as people on the ground? No, actually, the majority of people in the Middle East, based on the protest and Mm -hmm. everything that it's been proven, uh, majority of people in the Middle East actually voting uh, voting for Trump. The anti-Americans are not voting for Trump, but they're actually would love to see Trump go away. Yeah, the anti-Americans. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That, yeah. that makes sense. I so, mean, yeah. Because like a Bernie Sanders in there who wants open borders and all that other <clears throat> shit, like, great, uh, we can bring that to t- America I'll a lot faster. This. I'll tell you this, and it's on my own responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, terrorists do love this kind of politics in the U.S. They love the fact that if, some, if a U.S. president has caused them a lot of trouble, putting a lot of pressure on them, there is a hope that four years later this person can go away. Mm-hmm. And it can change the whole entire game. Or perhaps the whole entire politics in the Middle East changes as our presidents change here in the U.S. So do they watch it as closely as we do over here? Much more than we do. Yeah, they're You're just, kidding. Yes. They're, just, they're just sitting over there laughing. Much more than we do. So like, like last night's debate, was it, it was a I, fucking shit show. I can tell you right now. They the were Ayat- watching it? People were watching The that? Ayatollah probably now have his little subha, the thing that he calls in his hand. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to watch that election and hope and pray that Trump goes away. <laughs> and I'm telling you that guarantee. This is my own responsibility. Sure. Yeah, but does even, the Iranian people wants to see Trump go away? Does the Iranian government wants to see? Does the Iranian government? I'm sorry, wants to see Trump go away? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hell yes. yeah. Yeah. It's a hard it's, yeah. It's they I, want him to go away. I, I wonder though. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's it's probably not that big a deal because you've you've said it before on the yeah. show, but in America we think in terms of years months and years and over there they think in terms of decades Mm -hmm. and and centuries at some point when it comes to foreign policy i'll I'll give it to them the middle east is long game is strong i mean their long game right now is just to (laughs) get into the u.s and fuck and have babies you know what i mean and that that, that's 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 one of the things they want to do obviously which makes sense but um it's another it's one of the another one of those reasons why i think that uh that not term limits but uh what do you call it or I guess term limits in this case. Like yeah. I think term limits are stupid. For like, in what other situation would you fire your CEO after four or eight years, regardless of their performance? What right. other what what other company? What what nonprofit or company? What would who would do that? Yeah. How does that make sense? No. Like I get the idea of. Um, we didn't like kings. We want to prevent tyranny. But even the founders, like George uh, Washington, had an eight-year run because he decided to. And every president after him had four or eight years because they decided to until FDR. Yeah. Like, it wasn't like... And FDR was, by all accounts, a good president. Like, you can not you can criticize him for some stuff that was maybe myopic and, and shit like that, but he get, we still have an election every four years. Yeah. Just keep having the election and let the guy... Why would you fucking set a limit on that? Yeah. It doesn't make any fucking sense to me. No, I don't know. And, and you know, shit... I guess age, but even then, it's not really a factor. Everybody's running from the Democratic side is virtually seventy nine years old. Yeah, but you still yeah. have to win the goddamn election. Like I know. you can't. I it, love. I have to say, you know, I love the the diversity right now that's among the Democratic Party because when you look at them, <laughs> all the old, old whites, whites. <laughs> all the rich, rich old white people, yeah, yeah that you know, they hate. <laughs> someone actually put that on like that. Yeah. I was like, really? Like, yep, that's that's it's, actually true. It, you know, it's, like, yeah. you like, have to think about it from from like. Yeah, your family's, your people's perspective yeah. back in the yeah. Middle East. Yeah. They're watching all these old white people yeah. that are rich as fuck, like talk shit about old rich white people. Yeah, like how do? That's I, the thing. I, I can't me. think of a, of a of a 
another example of you that. Have, you have two billionaires currently in it. Tom Steyer yeah. and yeah. Michael Bloomberg. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and they're trying to go up against the billionaire that they hate yeah. who is already in office. And it's yeah. like... Michael uh, Bloomberg is already like pissing me off right now. Because every time I want to watch a YouTube video or something, mm-hmm. his ads comes in my face. I hate to interrupt you. This yeah. this podcast is sponsored by Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's I'm out of here. He's, He's going to give us twenty five hundred bucks on everyone. It was uh, Michael McKeon, the comedian, was just like, uh, yeah. "Hey man, uh, I was at my my best friend's sonogram yesterday, yeah. and uh, on the on the sonogram that yeah. said." Sponsored by Michael Bloomberg. Yeah. On it. It's just like See, I, motherfuckers everywhere. I, I'm glad you guys have brought this up. As a Middle Eastern born Muslim, I, I have a lot of people in my community that argues with me. Like, how come you're like, you know, you're conservative and you're voting for the racist? And, yeah. and they have this conversation with me. And I, I just turn around and I, I say one thing. And I said, what is your parties about? Diversity. Yeah. I said, show me the diversity. <laughs> Where yeah. do they let you? be somebody like yeah. where would they let you be somebody i'm like elizabeth warren bernie sanders well she's Bloomberg. one she's won 1024th cherokee yeah so. she's she's a full she's a full indian she's got a so. drop i mean that's essentially like walking up to the ocean with an eyedropper like, <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's one. It it's like me claiming that i'm white you know yeah exactly <laughs> well, you are a whole, like, you're I'm white, a dude, fucking you know, like, a whale a tic tac um at hey, this y'all. point um, hell no so before before we get into to all the all the good stuff you got here yeah. we got some sponsors who pay for this whole shit wagon to be on the air first and foremost talking about ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros Everything is twenty five percent off. Are we in a wide, Jamie? Uh, this camera went hot, so I'm fixing it. No, are we? Are we in a wide? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Twenty five percent off of everything. Got a little tech difficulties in here. I uh, got a bunch of ladies running around in the background. Um, I'm kidding. It's not them. It's not them, but you, you always blame the women in situations like this. Uh, I think it's the temperature of the room, so you could probably blame that on women. Yeah, We're always trying to turn it down, and they're always trying, trying to, turn to turn it, it up. up. Or, there's, or there's an Iraqi in the room that, of course. Well, yeah, you, exactly. You can't be trusted. Yeah, I know yeah. that. <laughs> Look at all that squiggly writing over here. Yeah. Oh, no. and we, we, uh, we keep it at 69 in this office, yeah, well, as always. For obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. Uh, go to ghostbed.com. Look, 25% off is, is the most I have to say at this point. Um, that is fucking incredible. Uh, it's it's still good with the page you go program no interest thirty six months ghostbed dot com is bringing you the motherfucking business dude um, that's the best deal you can get dude and th- look again it's no joke you put in the thirty six month uh, interest free shit and uh, boom you get twenty five percent off of everything it's like twenty bucks a month on all your favorite stuff next up we got killcliffcbd.com. dot com ooh how I love the Bunch of people hit us up yesterday on uh, on Drinking Bros Sports, D'Anthony, and they were like, "Yo, man, what was that promo code again?" It is Drinking Bros, kids. It is always Drinking Bros. Go to KillCliffCBD.com um, and, and type in the promo code Drinking Bros. 20 percent off everything and free shipping. Favorite flavors: uh, grape. That's my jam. It's my business. They got the orange Kush and they got the old uh, a little uh, <laughs> mango. Everybody's leaning towards the mango these days. Uh, it's getting popular. There's a mango uh, white claw out now too that everybody's really. And so really I went. Into. I went into the store and they had just you can solely buy a 12 pack now of just mango. You know what? I just heard from uh, some people. Actually, let me check and make sure I can say this out loud before I start talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hang on. Um, but go to KillCliffCBD.com uh, today and uh, and get on it, man. Uh, look, with that 20 percent off and free shipping with promo code Drinking Bros, knocks it down to about uh, 380 a can, which is dirt cheap. I mean, you can buy a can of Monster. You can get 25 milligrams of CBD uh, right in your mouth hole, and you will not test for it. Uh, 80% of our, our audience is military and first responder. You will not piss hot for this. So just want to kind of give you the heads up on that, mm. uh, and you're good to go. Uh, last but not least, talking about boxofawesome.com. Man, this is one of my faves because I don't know what I'm getting every month. It's just a box full of magic that shows up at your house if you are a dude or a lady. They got them for ladies now too, right? D'Anthony, a box of uh, awesome? Yeah, it's the same. It's, it's, uh, I don't think it's, I think it's bespoke. Well, no, it's on boxofawesome.com. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's all made by bespoke. It's the yeah, nicest yeah. shit on the planet. Yeah. It's, it's like bespoke walking gross, into yeah. uh, uh, what's that store in the mall, dude, where you get all the dopest shit? 
Um, shit, I know what you're talking about. Brookstone. Brookstone, yeah. It's, it's like rolling all, into Brookstone. It's got all that weird technology. Yeah, it's the best, dude. You go on, you write in five questions, answer five questions about yourself. They'll tell you what kind of man or lady you are, and then they'll shit, they'll send you shit accordingly, and it's all the nicest shit on the planet. Um, again, I got a, fu- I got a hatchet, dude. I got a sweet ass hatchet. Um, a hatchet comes in handy when some Iraqi dude sneaks in to your studio. Or if you're, if you're <laughs> well, that squiggly rotten, hell uh, no. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, dude. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. She's got one. Yeah. She's probably got two strapped to the back of her calf. Um, it helps her debate better, I think. Well, yeah. she needs two or three more, <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> She'll be out, let's face it, after Super Tuesday. She's I, I just don't think that anybody wants to hear her talk. You know, there's like other people, moms I, that I, do. I think people want to hear the information. Yeah. I just don't think they want to hear it from her. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, but go to boxofawesome.com today. Promo code Drinking Bros, 20% off. Uh, it's like 45 bucks, and it is the nicest shit that gets sent to your house. Again, I got a dop kit one time. I got a travel bag. I got a hatchet. I got a whiskey decanter. Um, and they're always mixing it up. We got some, Je- Jesse, my wife, got some cooking uh, knives. Um, just the, the, the finest quality products there is at boxofawesome.com. Promo code Drinking Bros, 20% off your first box. Uh, Hamidi, what do you got for us uh, today here? Because um, um, you come, you're, you always come with the business here. I always, <laughs> yeah. It's, so this is um, in detail of what's been going on right now. Iran is basically how but a plan mm-hmm. um, to encounter all the problems they've been having, which is the most difficult things, as I mentioned before, is that the Revolutionary Guard did not know how they can control this new generation that's open to social media, open to the Internet. Uh, it's more connecting with America naturally. Than, than any other time. Now, do they have access of the internet over there the same way that we do? Is it? Uh, yes, of course. Or, so, or are the sites limited? Uh, I, I think, you know, it's not the same as we do, but it's limited. They do, they have Facebook. Okay. Uh, they, they have YouTube. The, they can search, you know, anything on Google. Oh, wow. Uh, so they right. can follow now some of our, you know, shows, our uh, Hollywood actors and all this that's been going on. So the, the world has been open over there. And something about the Iranian regime that you might not know. The Iranian regime has a policy on, on their constitution. It's called they want to export the revolution to the rest of the Middle East. Their dream is to, to control the Middle East from the river to the sea. That's how they want to do it. Okay. So this is actually part of it. But now they're facing all these issues with people going out against them. They realize is they need to invest more in the psychological operation aspect mm-hmm. <clears throat> and how they can control the mindset of this young Iraqi that's being born now. If this young Iraqi or young Yemeni or young Lebanese or Syrian it's born now uh, being all about America, this is not going to serve their interest. So they need to make sure that the next child is born is going to automatically hate America. So what they're doing is right now they're updating their budget. They actually have a broad... Um, hundreds of Iraqi media reporters to Iran to train them. Really? And, yep, and that was actually just days before Soleimani was killed. Um, there's actually a picture here you can drop of the meeting with Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, the general that died with Iran. Yeah, put that up, Jamie. Yep. Okay. There's a picture in a meeting in an operation room, and you'll see Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, the general that died with Soleimani, is sitting, and there are... <clears throat> people sitting around him, these are the top reporters in Iraq. These are not just any random reporters. These are the top ones. It's just like you come to America and you take the top Like reporters. Dan Rather. Exactly. Before, yep. Yeah, before he lost his mind. Yeah. Before he lied. Yeah. About, like Megyn Bush. Kelly. Yep. And no. they, Hannity. <laughs> Hannity, yes. Yeah. So they Megan took Kelly. him there. And what they're <laughs> doing is they're paying them salaries between $600 to about 2000 American dollars. Okay. Per story? Per person. A month. Okay. Mm. And what they're doing for them is, right now, so far, they have 17 channels in Iraq that works for Iran, that operates all with the same agenda that Iran wants. They decided to update that from 17 to about 22. Okay. They have three podcasts, five newspapers. They, podcast? they do have three podcasts. You're kidding yeah, me. Yeah, they have three podcasts. They have a th- uh, five newspapers, two magazines, and they have six research centers. All their job is to do is to research the ideas, mm-hmm. research the content, and put it out there so they can control mm-hmm. the nation psychologically. 
uh, so that way you don't you don't think America is a good country anymore. Yeah. Because we're all going to report the same thing about America. And they have about 128 Facebook page. That's really away from the Facebook pages that's owned by the channel. Okay. These are just 128 random Facebook pages that they put out there, and all its job right now to basically enhance the picture of the Iranian regime in the Middle East to make more animosity towards the United States. We are basically in a war right now, media-wise, with Iran. And they were doing this for the last decade. Yeah. However, they just realized that they were not doing enough. So now they're updating this. They're spending actually another $5 million to update this. To well, get it. I, I think with everything that happened in the 2016 yeah. election, right, yeah. with, with America and Russia, and they're saying, oh, Russia... Fucking rig the elections, which yeah. Dan, you know the exact number. What did they spend on Facebook ads? About a hundred thousand dollars. hundred thousand. I think it was one hundred thirty. And again, if you believe what you read on Facebook, yeah. you're a fucking idiot who, who deserves yeah. to be duped, anyways, right? Yeah. Uh, but with that, I think it opened the door and the possibility for all these other governments, like yeah. Iran and Iraq, to yeah. say, "Hey, man, we can control our own narrative exactly. psychologically. We don't have to put people. We don't have to put soldiers outside of people's doors anymore." Yeah. We can uh, the psychological warfare yeah. warfare is almost stronger than 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 the actual physical war. Yes, I agree on that hundred percent. Because now yeah. you're getting kids who are growing up on the internet, yeah, uh, who are either or watching TV or their tablets or whatever, reading the same news, talking about the same subjects, and, and everybody's believing in the same yeah. essentially belief that's being fed to them by the yeah. government. That to me is more dangerous than, hey, yeah. you need to join the war or, or you know put a soldier yeah. outside somebody's house. So what you, you can you, like behind closed doors, you can still say whatever you want, even if a soldier was outside your door, obviously, you know, absolutely. But now with this, it's like, hey, man, now we can control it every single day, all day long. Everything they read, yeah. hear, listen to or talk about is going to be their own yeah. controlled narrative yeah. and their own hatred for the United States. Yeah, indeed. And, and I'll tell you, the way they're doing it is so fascinating. Like when I when I was getting this information, I was so shocked with how they're doing things. This is not just to actually. Um, do things that are anti-America because Iran is trying to shut any voice right now that speaks against it. So this actually is to shut down Sunnis who might speak against Iran and Iraq because Iran is, you know, a Shia. Mm -hmm. It's to shut down Sunnis and also to shut down Shia that are also going to speak against Iran. So some of these reporters is job to brainwash and some of them is job to face the other line, to face like a, a good media reporter how can we face this person how can we really make this person look stupid mm -hmm. and make him look so they figured <clears throat> so many different styles of doing that so they what iran did right now it basically established an army media <laughs> army and the person that's actually assigned on this right now his name is uh Aga shahini he is the media advisor in the iranian embassy in baghdad this is the first time someone put in this guy name out there. Right. He does not exist. He hides under the table. Nobody sees who he is. But his name is Shahini. He is the the Iranian media advisor in the in the Iraq in the Iranian embassy in Baghdad, Iraq. Okay. And the other person that's helping him, because you know, this is an Iranian. This is a guy who doesn't speak Arabic probably and needs someone a little bit more involved in this who is more in the media, in mm -hmm. the Arabic media. And the next guy that's helping him, his name is uh, Qasim Kassir, which we have his picture. We'll drop it in here. Okay. Yeah, uh, Jamie, post that. Yep. Okay. Qasim Kassir is basically Hezbollah. He's a Lebanese, uh, uh, Lebanese media reporter okay. who worked for like various uh, media stations before, channel, media, like, you know, TV stations. And he is basically the one that right now orchestrating, putting all this, setting all this cells within the media and to have a control and a grip over the media in the Middle East. Because their job is to control the whole Middle East mindset. This is not just Iraq. This is the Middle East, specifically the Arab world. And to also um, speak against to promote anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. speak against Israel, uh, against the Saudis, who are basically their, you know, they have animosity with them, they are their enemies, against the Saudis, against the other Arab countries that are standing up to Iran. And the, the crazy part here is that they are using Facebook part of this. That's why they're putting more money. Does Zuckerberg know this? <clears throat> okay, so this is not saying that Facebook is intentionally helping Iran. Facebook is actually doing is a great job 
to trying to shut down all these uh, pages, all these uh, pages that are being created by Iran. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and what they're doing is uh, Facebook has been shutting down a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. um, however, <laughs> they figured a new technique. You know, which is called uh, what we called it earlier is a deep, deep fake, deep fake. Yeah, deep fake. So the deep fake works here when we're doing it in English, when someone is faking a Trump speech and using the same lip techniques mm -hmm. to that. They, they said something they didn't say. So it, to, to, be, to clarify for yeah, the audience, are, yeah. are people in Iraq and Iran watching yeah. videos of, of President Trump that are fake by somebody possible? Do, doing his voice, yeah, and saying, absolutely possible. We need to keep firing away at Iran. Oh, absolutely, because that's like that. what Iran does: is always try to make you look bad as an American. Right? They always try to make you look like the enemy. So what they doing? I, I want to see an Iranian dude doing a Trump accent. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. what I want to see. It'd be gold. I because yeah. well, I will say this: the reason I bring this up, I saw <laughs> the Putin one the other yeah. day, and it was it was real hard to distinguish Distinct. if it was real or fake. Yeah. And I was just like, yeah. It's, I knew it because of the article title, yeah. and they were like, hey, give this a watch. This is how close we're getting. So if you look into Facebook, uh, deepfake is basically, it works when you do it in English. However, Facebook do have employees uh -huh. who are supposed to do that for them when people speak Arabic or other languages. However, in the Middle East, we don't speak like Americans and English language uh, speaking like all the same kind of language that's it, kind of similar. Idioms don't translate yeah. well. Like right. like uh, if you were to say, I, I don't have a dog in that fight right. yeah. or something like that, that doesn't mean shit to an Iraqi person. So And, and uh, the other part is that we have different dialects. Dialects, which means it's almost a different language. So if let's say if someone in Facebook is vetting this some other video, which it could be of an Iraqi pol politician that's trying to speak against Iran, or maybe they're faking something about some guy saying something about, uh, you know, th they want to make someone look bad, or more of like def defaming somebody. Mm -hmm. It works uh, if the employees are from that country and knows that dialect, it works. If the person that Facebook has that's supposed to vet that video or supposed to recognize it is not from that country, uh, just because of, if a Moroccan speaks, they can never understand me and I can never understand them. That's how it is. It's not like English where you can talk to an Australian and you can uh, you talk to a Brit. It doesn't work this way. Right. So what they're doing is is they learned that Facebook have a hard time distinguishing that. And they've been using this technique to actually go in after their uh, enemies uh, in the media wise uh, putting uh, words that you didn't say mm -hmm. out there to make you look bad and um, even though Facebook has been doing a good job every once in a while they're doing a campaign they've been deleting a lot of pages but as many pages they get deleted as more as they make perhaps they're establishing 128 pages that most likely will do paid ads but if the Iraqi channels pay those ads, it doesn't look anything. It's it's not against Facebook freedom of speech. It's not it's not violence. It's not sexual. It's morally just news. Yeah. So the point of it is, it you might think it's just news. If, if you sit, sit of it as as Ross Peterson working for Facebook and you look at it, you be like, there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah. But the whole point of it, of that uh, that ad or that video is to get people actually to slowly build them towards hating America, hating the Middle East, showing them that what America is going to do to them. So you're talking about a new generation of Iraq that's going to come out, or new generation of Syria and Yemen and other countries are going to come out already automatically hating America. So let me ask you this. No one at Facebook uh, or the people that work at Facebook are yeah. Middle Eastern? They do. They do. That's what I'm saying is they do have Middle Eastern, uh -huh. but they might not have the right Middle Easterns. They, may, ah, they might. If you bring gotcha, a gotcha, Moroccan gotcha. Yep. to try to figure <laughs> something out that someone is an Iraqi speaking, I can give you 100% guarantee that person would never be able to figure that yeah. out. Got you it, have to bring it, someone it. who actually speak that dialect and understand it correctly and can know the words and know the personalities in order to know if that's a defect or if that's a real conversation. So that is something... Even though, like, I'm not saying Facebook no, Facebook doesn't know about this. Uh, it's un un intentional, but yeah, they need face to work harder. Fa Facebook isn't uh, an intelligence organization. So they don't have a staff of translators for every single goddamn Arabic dialect. Exactly, There's no yeah. way they would. Yeah. I mean, 
Why would they? This just keeps getting worse and worse, doesn't it? It's not going to stop. <laughs> it just know. is what it is. I know. I mean, they're they're using <clears throat> the same thing uh, we're using here for like our own elections or whatever, but they're using it for long term because they don't have election. You know what I mean? Like they, they control <laughs> everything. <laughs> the, down there, they're using it for the long term. For the next 10 years, we need to fix this. We need to make sure the next generation is absolutely right. the way we want them to think. And perhaps the information I got, they said it's the most difficult job for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard right now is to do this job. I'm sure. Because uh, this yeah. is the easiest, cheapest way to, to pass out information. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rather well, than, I mean, because you, you, you don't have to go. It, it's costly to send people out in the streets. Yeah. It's costly to fucking line people up and do all that other shit. This well, is, it's, it's more than just, it's costly in ways other than financial as well. Yeah. Like there's political, like your, your economy suffers it, because of trade deals getting shut down and shit. But if you can just do shit in secret, I mean, this is what the U.S. has been doing for years. We used to, uh, during the Cold War, this, one, one of my college professors, he was an, uh, an Air Force intelligence guy, um, retired obviously, uh, told me that during the Cold War, they would fucking, uh, they drop these leaflets over uh, parts of uh, uh, the former Soviet Union. They like, used to do it in World War II as well, right? Yeah, yeah. but they, these were, I mean, it was like crazy stuff. They would drop leaflets that talked about Americans having bigger dicks and they put like a Magnum condom on it and drop them out of the fu- just like it was a test to see if they cared about that like they, if they if the women would start turning on their dudes and coming and like coming over to the US side really of bigger dicks like there that's just one example wow. he told me a million of them like this is all this weird shit that we did back then in the cold war yeah but on um, yeah the US has been doing this shit for years Oof. It's not like uh, I, don't, I don't. The difference is this, though. We didn't have like ten years ago. We didn't have social media. We didn't have you, yeah. YouTube. Was what <laughs> just turned fifteen years old. We yeah. didn't have YouTube. We didn't have in our generation, right? We do now, but uh, for my kids and uh, watching them come up, like all they use is YouTube, you know, TikTok, weird yeah. shit like that. And it's like once you're able to control that, it's it's game over. Um, well, I mean, look, because like, trying to stop it as a parent. Is, I, I think the next generation after our kids, there's going to be some kind of rebellion against technology, I think, because that's how it works. Like the humanity is very cyclical when it comes to stuff like that. So you're right. we go. You're right, by the way. I just had this conversation with Jesse. I, uh, I, I think it's there's a happen. group of kids right now who what, what was it called in the Ross Patterson revolution? Norm Corps is what it's called. Yeah. Uh, they're rebelling against these teenagers in America yeah. are rebelling against dressing up <laughs> slutty or trying to look attractive. They're yeah. wearing mom jeans, w- those white, thick sneakers, like mm-hmm. like your aunts wear. I mean, they look, and it's cute girls where you're just mm-hmm. like, dude, you look horrific. They're not yeah. wearing makeup. They're not doing, it's like Billie Eilish, wearing baggy clothes and shit like yeah. that. They're covering mm-hmm. up and they're like, oh, we're, we're fighting back against society. And it's like. It's weird how that works. I mean, like with, uh, the more successful you become, so you, we started. We lived outside, mm-hmm. had to hunt, fish, gather, etc. Right, fight off our enemies all the time. And now we live indoors, and we do all those things for recreation. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So now we've uh, <laughs> the things that we. I, I guess if you if you want to take it that direction, Fight Club. What does he say? And that and what Chuck Palahniuk write. Uh, the things we own end up owning us. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Social media is definitely becoming like that. Like it's becoming, yeah. it, it's a virus. It's too powerful and everybody has access to it. It's like just having a fucking, it's like an open air office, right? And there's a fucking red button, but there's no, there's not even a line. You can just walk up and press it anytime you want. Yeah. yeah. Not, that, not that there's not even security. There's not even a goddamn line. You can walk over there and do whatever the fuck you want. You can press that button all day. And uh, where, where I feel like it's iRobot, Isaac Asimov. Like, yeah. where, where, what's the right question to be asking right here? Where is this all going? Like, what, what's the next threat that's going to – because, I mean, we, we think about the normal shit, like our energy infrastructure, power grid and all that stuff, right. and banking and fucking jails that are – I mean, like all these institutions that are controlled by uh, computer systems, right, mm-hmm. that, are, that have become – a lot less secure because of social media and a lot more accessible because of it. And, uh, what, but we think about those kind of things. Those are obvious. Like if you're a risk assessment person, but how do you imagine something that doesn't exist? You know yeah. what I mean? I mean? That's 
I mean, imagine how ISIS uh, used Twitter yeah. as one of their main communication. They apps. still they are. are. They still are. Yeah, yeah. still are. And how, you know, the thing is they jump on the same platform that we're on, which is, you know, it's an opportunity for them. They're going to take it. However, you know, Al-Qaeda have used it on social media, but I think the way Iran is using it, it's completely different because these other terrorist organizations are using it for communication, uh, for talking about their battles they, they, that they won or the ground they've been controlling. But when it comes to Iran, Iran is shooting for the next 10 years. Right. And that's the difference, is that you're facing a country that is fighting against every American interest, period. And you know, a lot of people here would say, you know, if we have left those countries alone, they would leave us alone. That's not true. That's right. BS. Try it out. Leave them alone. See what they will do. I mean, we left Afghanistan alone yeah. for about 20 years yeah. after we kicked the Russians out of the air. Exactly. And that's why I'm like, if you leave them alone, it doesn't mean they're going to stop hating you. It doesn't mean they're going to stop trying to run after your interest. Yeah. They're going to do the same thing <clears throat> anyway. So I'd rather be in front of them than be far away from them. And they're shooting for the next 10 years because right now they knew that the social media have worked against them. And they're trying to figure out a way to use the social media in their own benefits yep. so they can control uh, and, and it's dangerous. Look, if a child is born in Iraq right now, going to be getting educated for the next 15 years about how evil America is. What do you think that c child is going to do when he's 17? Oh, yeah. He's going to fight uh, us. Yeah, he's going to come over here and he's, fucking he, try to bomb he's us. He's not even over here. He's going to fight our troops over there. Right. He's going to do something. So I think we are in a media war right now with Iran. That's We are much more involved media-wise in a war with Iran than it is um, a physical war. However, our media is not prepared for something like that. We don't encounter that kind of ideology or that kind of agenda. Mm -hmm. Our media pretty much kind of almost works against us as a nation. Uh, it it, it is, feels like it today. Yeah, yeah. it is. I mean, it, it is working against us. It's not. You know what I mean? Because if you if you <laughs> sympathize with the enemy, I, I don't. I think that's very un-American, in my opinion. Like, for me, that's how I feel as well. Yeah, it, it's it's very un-American. Because yeah. for me, it's like, hey, if you if you think, um, if you think that you know we should have never done this or that, you're ignorant. That's what many people thinking. Like, we shouldn't have touched Soleimani. Well, what about the 600 Americans that he killed? Yeah. Do we just walk away from that? Do we just say it? We'll, we'll forget it. You know, it's, it's just more misinformed. And the media, of course, is not giving you the true message of what's going on, which is the reason why I don't go online. And here's my information. It's yeah. all in papers. I, and the, the interesting yeah. part about the, the, the Soleimani thing, looking yeah. back on it now, right? Yeah. For years and years and years. You know, Bush administration, Obama administration, we could have took yeah. him out. Everybody was afraid yeah. of what would happen, that yeah. it would lead to a, a third world war. Yep. I, how, I, how did we drastically underestimate how powerful Iran was? Because let's face it, not only has nothing happened at this point, yeah. they don't want anything to happen. And now we know how weak their military is. Mm -hmm. Why didn't we do this years ago? Was it out of fear of like everybody saying, oh, no, they've got this amazing military? And no, because they were winning psychologically. That's it, right? That's all of it. They were winning psychologically. Because if you remember when they uh, detained the Navy sailors, mm -hmm. remember that? When oh, they yeah, detained yeah, yeah, them yeah. and they took yeah. them to you know, Iran, mm -hmm. they did that to the Brits. Why were they doing that back then? Why are they not doing it now? Uh, yeah, because now that they got popped, it seems like... But even before they got popped, yeah. they knew the reactions would be different. Yeah. It's that when they did something, they knew the reaction of that government, whether if it was a Republican or Democrat. They knew and they analyzed <laughs> and they behaved based on that. Perhaps in my opinion, that if you don't use the right psychology with Iran, they will be all over you. Yeah. It's because Iran's is not, they're not stupid. The, the government of Iran, I, I'm, I'm saying it clear, <laughs> they're not stupid people. Yeah. They're extremely smart. People want uh, our president, whomever it is, to be respectful and nice and shit like that. And that is not how it goes over there. That, like, if, if I'm in Iraq and I'm interrogating somebody, I'm going to slap the shit out of them in the face with my open hand. I'm just going to slap them because that's how they, they respond to that. They respond to handguns, not rifles. They're not afraid of rifles. But if you pull out a handgun, not that I'm saying you should interrogate somebody with a handgun. I'm just saying, like, there's certain. Why is that, by the way? Because uh, that was Saddam's choice of execution method. Okay. For the most part, line people up, shoot them in the back of the head. With that's 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 what I've heard. Anyways, yeah. but uh, people want the president 
Like, one of the things that a lot of people said when Obama got elected is, like, he immediately brought dignity back to the fucking White House. Like, okay, great, man, that's great. But the president's job, part of it is to be, to represent the country, I suppose, in a, in a good way. But as the commander-in-chief, his job is to win wars or prevent wars from happening. And one way to do yeah. that is to straight up tell Iran, we're going to fuck you up if you keep fucking around. Yeah. Like, there's nothing wrong with saying that. That's part of the psychological yeah. battle between our countries. So... I remember this uh, bit Dennis Miller did back in the day, and it was when kind of when he was going through his process of changing from a super liberal to being more conservative. Mm -hmm. And this is when Bush had was going, I think, in in the reelection phase of 2003, 2004. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. He was like, everybody always huffs and guffaws about nuclear. Well, like, under what circumstances should we ever use nuclear weapons? He's like, I don't know if we run out of the normal ones. (laughs) <laughs> like, why Why are we, like, why do we have all, all this shit? Not that we should be eager to use nukes, but if somebody's over there talking about attacking our country and we have, like, we, honestly, it's like, uh, it's like that Louis C.K. thing where the girl was on the phone. Yeah, yeah, ma- and he was masturbating. It's yeah, like, it's why, like, why didn't you hang phone? up the fucking phone? Yeah. Like, we have the ability to hang up the phone on anybody we want forever. So why are we suffering these idiots? No, yeah. just get fucked. Yeah. Like, yeah. we don't have to necessarily nuke anybody, but we have other weapons now. We have a rail gun that shoots like a 65-foot piece of metal that is about like a two t- t- kiloton yield. It's like a small nuke. Like a normal yield is like 10 kiloton to 25, something like that. But uh, <sighs> we could just drop one of those on an uninhabited area in Iran. Just like... and and people would see the goddamn mushroom cloud yeah and be like hey next one's gonna hit a city it's that goddamn simple dude i look i i I know it i get it yeah also like we we we, i mean that's not saying that we're we're gonna go be disrespectful for every country we we, we couldn't be respectful to a lot of countries who are very respectful to us but when it comes to an enemy who is using a dirty psychology against you, mm-hmm. you have to have a different language. And I believe that whether if it was Obama, Bush, or Trump, um, we needed to send a message to Iran saying, like, look, we are capable of stopping you. <coughs> yeah, uh, We're not going to use this psychology. We're not going to let you get all over us or intimidate us. And Iran needed that kind of air pull yeah. a little bit. They needed their airs to be pulled a little bit because they were getting – during you know the years that Obama was in office, that God bless them, they got so aggressive. They were all over our navy. They were driving their their little boats very close to our navy vessels, trying to threat us, uh, using all kind of threats in the radio, all kind of intimidation techniques. What happened when Trump came to office before Soleimani was airstriked? Did they ever practice any of these moves? No. Because yeah. they realize it's a different person in front of them, and they realize it's a different party, and they don't want to go to war. Uh, but th- before they knew that they can harass the U.S. because the U.S. W- the U.S. government back then had a policy of not going to war at mm. all unless America gets attacked. Right. So they were doing everything they can because they understand your kind of your your policy. So n- now they see a different person. They, their behavior have changed. They're more careful. They're more conserved now. And, and mark my word, if, if Trump comes out in office and someone else come in, watch Iran behaves. Yeah. Watch the whole Middle East changes into, because how did the Middle East change? It's based on every U.S. president that came along. What happened to us in Iraq when ISIS in 2014 and 15 took over Mosul and destroyed Iraq, pretty much took 30% of Iraq? Why did that happen? Who did we have in office? We had Obama. A lot of people are like, oh, you can't blame that on Obama because Bush is the one did this because he entered Iraq. No, no, has, this has nothing to do with it. What happened to us in Iraq? Because we pulled the troops out of Iraq. Look what happened to Iraq. Change. So the Middle East life really depends on this election mm. every, every four years in America. This is where the Middle East really has to watch. I don't think the Iraqis or the Iranians or the Syrians or the Yemenis or the Lebanese should watch their own election. They should be watching more of their American election. Yeah, this is what's going to determine their future. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, last question before I let you get out of here today. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people ask every time you're on the show. They're like, "Why does he do it? Why does he come on and, and name names and uh, and out people 
um, and essentially put yourself in harm's way by this. Because like you said, you know, people yeah. are listening over there. They know that yeah. Drinking Bros is now officially a spy for Iran yeah, yeah. Or, or spying on <laughs> Iran. Um, yeah. I, I, I've had the, the same answer yeah. to them. I'm like, look, I don't think you understand how much Hamidi yeah. loves America and yeah. loves his own country of Iraq that yeah. you're doing it because you want to be a help, right? Yeah. I'm doing this. I've been unharmed since 2003, um, you know, in front of this enemy. I've been fighting this enemy before any one of you knew anything about it. Right. And before, I was more of a soldier, <coughs> a secret soldier for the government or the intelligence community. That's what I was, which people didn't know who I was. I feel like I'm much more effective if I am that secret soldier for the American people. Because if the American people are educated about this, mm -hmm. if they understand it, then there's no room for the mainstream media. There's no room for anybody to control their brain. <laughs> because what do they say all the time about people who are like you and Daniel? They're misinformed. They don't know. That's why they think the way they think, because they don't know. And the truth is, is that there's so many powers, which is media and everything, are trying to shift your thinking. So for me, I think I found much more pride, even though the information I provided back in the day saved American lives. That's different. But the information I brought today is important. I feel it's important because if the American people are informed, I'm going to win my war. If the American people are not informed in this situation, then I'm losing this battle. So I feel that I, feel that, like, I am much more... I, feel more, I find more pride of actually informing the American people and, and opening that wall that's in front of their face to the Middle East, to what the really truth is, because there's no way of getting the truth. Yeah. And, and you know, um, you, you, you noticed that the information I provided in the last podcast was actually something just got released 48 hours ago. And that's, that's what is it for me. You know, for me, I didn't care what the information did. And perhaps I shared a, a document with Daniel a couple, mm -hmm. uh, a couple nights ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a declassified document. <clears throat> and uh, we were joking about it. I, mm -hmm. said, I said, one day I'll, I'll tweet this to President Bush. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, it, to me, I really didn't care what, the, what I provided in the past, how impactful it was on the U.S. government. I, I think it's, it's important that, for me, this is my passion. I loved <laughs> collecting info on that enemy. And the enemy, of course, hated it. You know, if you, when you read my book or my film, they hated it. Right. They hated every bit of it. Because what I was doing is I was bringing you a picture that you couldn't see. I was providing you with a view that you couldn't see it. And um, I loved it. I enjoyed it. I felt that was like my orgasm in yeah. Iraq. is taking the Americans from being un uninformed not know what's going on, to put them right in the real situation. And this time I see myself taking the American people, not the government, not the intelligent community, and put them in that seat so they can see really what goes on. And they don't have to be misinformed because they shouldn't be. The American people are smart people. Yeah. And they shouldn't be blocked from that world. Man, uh, you're, you're a fascinating dude. And uh, we always enjoy having you on. This is the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week. I'm actually going to give this to you, D'Anthony. Um, you threw me a surprise party last night. I didn't have anything to do with it. Really? <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> he throws parties for nobody. <laughs> He's like, I'm I was going to try it. to be nice to him. No. Like, hey, man, this is fucking like, awesome last night. Tiffany, Tiffany DM'd me and was like, hey, who can I talk to about getting their friends from the neighborhood together? So I just hooked her up with uh, Bayou Brooke. Oh, great, great. So then and, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give this to Tiffany then. Yeah, Tiffany. Uh, and the Drinking Bro X podcast. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, fuck Dan. I didn't do anything. Piece of shit. Yeah. I, I literally. <laughs> he just showed up to eat and drink. That's all he showed up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the, the most I did was not ruin the surprise, I suppose. Yeah. Great. Great. Because I didn't know that it was happening. Oh, uh, God. You can, you, always, made, you can always depend on Dan. You made it wrong. Look too good right now. I, I put people together. <laughs> I make connections. That's what I do. That's, like, that's honestly yeah. figuring out problems and putting people together is what yeah. I do best. So there we go. Okay. I did it. Minim, right. Minimal effort is 
pretty much my go-to. Tiffany Hart, then. Thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate it. it was yeah, fun she's last a night. better person than I am, obviously. Whew, we got fucked up last night. Yep. Uh, how many? Uh, where can everybody find you on social media? <laughs> uh, I am on Instagram, the Terrorist Whisper. Mm-hmm. Um, on uh, and I'm the Terrorist Whisper, perhaps everywhere. On Amazon, the film is the Terrorist Whisper. Yep. And uh, the the book is on my website, theterroristwhisper.com. That's where people can get the book. Hell yeah, hell yeah. yeah. Thanks again for being here. We appreciate it. My pleasure. As always, for Anthony Anthony Holly. Holloway, how many to see you? I am Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.